Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. Global Virtual Accelerator for Startups. We operate from Silicon Valley with the mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. Today, the community we touch is about a half a million people, and we have various different touch points through which you are interacting with us. Um, and we are fine with whatever works for you. We try to create many, many different uh, opportunities for using the program. This is one of them. This is kind of the flagship mentoring, free mentoring session that's been going on since the fall of 2008. 378th session today, so pretty, you know, robust uh, progression there. We've had the opportunity to work with many, many, many of you entrepreneurs from all over the world for all these years, and, uh, you know, we've had tens of thousands of people. We've had, I think, at this point, over 60,000 people participate in these programs, and uh, it's been a real privilege to uh, learn about what you are doing, what, uh, you know, what you're working on, what you're struggling with in different parts of the world. The roundtable is being recorded. You'll find all prior recordings of our roundtables at our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. You'll find other video content there as well. If you're live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. And our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and mine is at Shromana. In from both channels, we publish an enormous amount of uh, very rich content on entrepreneurship that you can learn from and grow through. What's on your slide are our call-in instructions. We're not quite ready for call-in yet. However, we will be, and uh, we would like you to participate as much as possible. That's how you learn the most, by engaging actively. Um, this is a roundtable, not a broadcast, so we like you to be part of it as much as possible. We're going to start today with a conversation with Padmaja Ruparel, one of the pioneers of the Indian startup ecosystem. She's the co-founder and founding partner of Indian Angel Network, the oldest angel network in India. Padmaja, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you, Saramna. Thank you very much, Saramna. Tell us about Indian Angel Network and the journey you've had uh, building it, and uh, what is uh, what is work what is going on there now? What is working? What is not working? And what have you learned through this process? So you know the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the in the country here in India is very, very different to what it is in the Valley and elsewhere in the Western world. It's a much more nascent, much more, uh, less mature ecosystem. Uh, we, our first startup industry is the IT industry and that's only 25, 30 years old. So you can imagine how young the startup ecosystem is here. But I would say it's a, only about a decade old, really, that startup ecosystem. That's true. It's uh, about a decade old, and uh, it started with Thai coming here in 2000 or so. That's when I uh, operationalized Thai Delhi chapter, which is now the best performing chapter in the Thai world. And mm -hmm. about 10 years ago, I uh, co-founded Indian Angel Network, which was which literally brought the concept of angel investing to India. Mm -hmm. We started off uh, we started off with a very very uh, very very uh, simple model, as they would say. Uh, tried to do some copy paste and sell on our face because the ecosystem was very different here. The expectations were very different. The quality of business plans is very different. But we started off. We we grew over the years. We built we decided to build something which was a little different. Uh, we moved away from the model of a local 
uh, informal angel group to something which is global and institutionalized. So what mm -hmm. we did is we we decided that some of the foundations on which IEM would be built were really, um, you know, real-time information, leveraging domain expertise and geographic uh, connects of our investor members, real-time information for our investors, and underpinned with keywords, which I think are really what reflects IEM, which is money, because they invest, mentoring and market access which we provide. So it's a combination of these three that we thought would help the startup to really build up some very valuable global footprint com companies. So from the so can you the comment a little bit on um, the composition of the angels in India? Because again, the history of the IT ecosystem in India is very different from Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, there have been a lot of product success stories, and that's where the angels were born out of. And, you know, people would make money and then come back into the ecosystem with the experience of building product companies. But India's heritage is from the services business, whereas the um, bulk of the investment that happens in the startup ecosystem is in product companies or internet companies, stuff like that, which we don't operate at all in the service company mode. So I I, I believe you've had to navigate that tension. How has that played out? No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, people who are part of the investment network here, especially at IEN, we see people who really build garage to IPO companies. And the reason I mention that is whatever trajectory the company takes, uh, it, it starts with the services and now the, all these companies have moved into the product side, number one. Number two, the services companies are now not angel investable because these have become headcount businesses. And as we all know, angels are not really looking at headcount businesses, they're looking at very scalable, disruptive IP technology. Yeah. And that is where the services business is getting productized. That is where a lot of the uh, process businesses are getting productized. India is also the home of BPO and a lot of processing uh, and um, back office processing business. But all of that is getting productized very, very rapidly. But we are now entering the next and as angels, what we look for and what you understand as well is we don't look at the best, we look at the next phase or the next ventures, and that's where automation is coming in. So, you know, we have a lot of companies here, a lot of startups who are looking at AI, who are looking mm -hmm. at virtual reality, who are picking up gaps in the existing large company product suites and saying, how do we do this faster, cheaper, better, quicker? So, I think the the growth of innovation technology, the growth of innovation here has uh, spread in two directions. One, very rapidly in its evolution from services to products to cash to, to um, uh, AI and all, cl cloud and then AI and all of that. That's one thing. The other thread that has happened here is uh, India is known for its, in the, for its software, but now technology and software has become a horizontal, not mm -hmm. a vertical anymore. So the bug of scaling up automation, and I think the virus of entrepreneurship has hit every single sector that you can think of. So we've invested in companies even in manufacturing, in biotechnology, mm -hmm. stem cell. On the other hand, you know, in F&B, hospitality, and of course in technology, online, uh, all of, and, you know, robotics and uh, all of those. But the power of this country here in India is, is something phenomenal. While both of these, you know, the sectoral spread as well as the evolution that is happening on technology is growing, I think the market here is phenomenal. It's not only a large market. I mean, India represents a sixth of the world's population. But it's a market which is growing with as a domestic market. Disposable incomes are rising. Uh, 
GDP is tracking at around 6%, which is huge, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Choice has become, is formulating right to the market here, to customer uh, uh, profile here. And I think the fourth point, which is very important, is India has become a pilot market for many innovative products, be they in clean energy, sanitation, agri, education, healthcare. And once young startup companies sort of pilot it and build stable ventures, they go global into other developing markets as well, include yeah. and also in of the developed markets. I mean, mm -hmm. I can give you tons of examples. Uh, there's a company called Consor, which is into low-cost uh, medical device for incontinence. Born in India, um, you know, it's operationalized here. It's got everything worked out. Now it's catering to both the UK, UK and the US healthcare sector mm -hmm. market. So yep. I think that is what this country has become today. So um, let's talk a little bit about. Um you know, geography as it pertains to IT and IT-enabled services. That includes healthcare IT. Um, our audience is pretty much 100% focused on IT-enabled IT services. And um, one, you know, core um, algorithm, let's say, we have picked up from the, the way Indian investors are operating uh, by working with them for all this time is that they they like all the SaaS and cloud and AI and all this kind of technology. They would like those those companies to be uh, facing the U.S. market or the global market. But U.S. is you happens to be one of the markets where technology moves through early adoption phases the fastest. So when it comes to those kinds of ventures, they prefer that these companies do not uh, sell into the Indian B2B market. They want the B2B SaaS and B2B AI and so forth to be sold to the global market. Um, of course, there is the consumer B2C products that are India-facing that, um, that people are still interested in. There have been some kinks in that market as well in that uh, some of the companies that you know, are very overfunded, have not really had the fundamentals to the extent that um, they were expecting to have based on the GDP growth and the macro stats. Can you reflect on these dynamics a bit, on what, what, how you and your investor pool parses all this in the current uh, work, in the early stage investment work? Well, that's a very good point, actually. I, I mean, very interesting point. So, what is happening here from the angel point, angel investor perspective, and that means that at the startup level, the companies that are B two B are actually getting faster investments now. And mm -hmm. uh, the interesting part is that uh, let me take you back one step, uh, which is interesting, is that angels here are part time angels. Unlike, mm -hmm. let's say, the U.S. or the U.K., where the angels are full-time, that's their job, that's their career, or that's what they do. Here, well, we have India, both. Most of our, most, yeah, but here, most of our angels are part-time. They're either sitting as CEOs or CXOs or chairman or whatever. And um, mm -hmm. there are a minority which are only angel investing. Now, what this is bringing as an advantage to the startup is that they are directly connected to people who are decision makers in their company. So mm -hmm. as they build these young B2B propositions and, you know, they pick up the B2B model, they are, they, these investors who are sitting as CXOs, are quick, they quickly pick up these companies, introduce them to their corporates or their friends' mm -hmm. corporates, and help the company to grow. And mm -hmm. once they've again, so, so there is a huge corporate sector here where these companies can go, and we have several examples where they've done well and exited in about three to four years, making a huge return. But the bigger part, like a company like Druva or Sapiens, who are product companies, B2B product companies, they 
they started here they they got the tra- they had the advantage of talent they had the advantage of cost they had the advantage of piloting and bringing their product literally to a very robust stage and building revenue and then they went and uh, went to the global market so druva mm-hmm. obviously moved to the valley and you know the story is now racing to become a big company and Sapiens just got um, partnered by Credit Suisse, right? So mm-hmm. what is happening is these young B2B companies are, are piloting it, building domestic revenues, proving the model, proving the product, building the technology, the customization, and then partnering with global companies, either as customers or joint ventures or whatever. So that is one part that is happening very rapidly. There is another part, which is that there are young B2B companies in India which are not necessarily even focused on the global market. They are just focused on the domestic Indian market and they're building very rapidly because they're focused on the Indian products. For instance, if you look at a fintech company, for example, they completely focused on the uh, 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 tweak that has happened here, you know, the whole uh, indirect system of taxation has changed with the GST yeah. coming in on the 1st of July this year. There are a number yeah. of companies which have picked that up, built products, and the market here is enormous. They're not even, they don't even have the imagination or the time to imagine to go overseas. There's so much business here. So that is another class of B2B product companies that have, that have sort of mushroomed and are growing well here. On the B2C side, you're right. There are the you know the whole startup ecosystem, especially in the e-commerce, has taken a look, has has been heavily invested. You know the Flipkart and the Snapseed and Amazon sort of facing both of them. But what is also being created here is with these e-commerce companies and the amount of investment and the spread that they have done, India infrastructure is not at its best. So it's created a lot of other new companies which are playing to, which are complementing these large companies. For example, mm-hmm. logistics companies, right? Yeah. So if you think yeah. of company like Farai, or you think of company like Loginet, or you think of all these companies that picked up gaps in the delivery side, or in the supply side, or in the packaging side, or whatever, and yeah. these companies yeah. around them. Instead of so the e-commerce play, a Flipkart or an Amazon or a, a Snapdeal, they they are bringing together. They are aggregators of products and customers, right? But they have mm-hmm. to be delivered. Who's delivering them? It is a whole host of young companies which are actually uh, delivering them, and they are riding on the growth of the B2C space that the e-commerce players are doing. And the last piece is that. B2P has grown up from a different perspective also, again. In India, you have the whole uh, spectrum, you know, the telecom growth that has happened yes. with, with both Airtel, mm-hmm. Geo, and all of, and Paytm, which is coming from the FinTech space. So mm-hmm. a lot of companies are leveraging these platforms and catering to the B2C play. So there is a B2B play, there is a B2C play, and there is a B to B to C play. So that's what's becoming extremely interesting. I mean, there is an agri company which has um, built its revenue model on a B to B space, but its delivery is on B to C space. So mm-hmm. it's very interesting what's happening here. So Padmaja, why don't we uh, talk about some of your companies that align with these trends that you just very nicely outlined? What are some of the highlights in your portfolio that uh, cater to some of these trends? Yeah, I, as I was, I was trying to list them in as I gave, you know, as I was responding to your earlier questions. But let me focus on them a bit. So yeah. let's pick up the company like Sapiens, for example. It's a product yeah. company on performance and productivity, right? Yeah, and Sapiens is our portfolio company as well. Yeah, and now they are moving to the valley with Credit Suisse as their partner. Druva is a very good but an old story from our network, yes. which we have invested in. Again, a B2B play, and now partnered with Global Majors, uh, 
especially the big four and all, a lot of the IT companies, to be honest. What about uh, the more recent you know, ones? What are what are you what have you invested in, in the last couple of years yeah. that are looking really yeah. interesting yeah. and promising? Yes, that's where I was coming. The other is like if you look at uh, Logimex, the logistics space which is partnered with KTM. Mm -hmm. If you look at Parai, which is tracking logistics, right? So as mm -hmm. as the delivery happens by the e-commerce place, this is completely real-time tracking system. They've mm -hmm. partnered with not only e-commerce place but a lot of the B2C players like the Domino's or you know the pizza delivery guys, and they're growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a there are companies in the agri space that have grown. For example, uh, bringing bringing a lot of the Again, in India, the marginal farmers exist, as you know. They are very small holdings, yeah. and they don't have money for capital uh, equipment. So yeah. companies are bringing this equipment on a lease model with the uh, young agriculture, the, sorry, the, the small farmers are able to literally rent out this equipment by hours. So mm -hmm. you know, it's like uberization of uh, mm -hmm. you know, farming equipment. Again, very interesting, growing very rapidly. We have robotics, for example. They've created products for the ed for educating young engineering students. So they've broken the whole engineering concepts and fundamentals and literally created tangible work working simulated models. And that's through robotics. Again, very interesting, right? So uh, we have an architecture company a company called Smart Visits, right, which has used virtual re reality to bring the whole plan, the architect's, architect's plan, onto a platform in such a way that it is diced and sliced almost in three dimensions through the virtual reality platform so mm -hmm. that uh, the civil contractor, the plumber, the electrician, the interior designer, they can all see the picture and yet they can pick out which of the pieces are each one needs to function. And it all saves so much time and money and rework that uh, it's, a, it's really taken it to the next level. It's sort of now partnering with some of the big global majors. Look at mm -hmm. Biotech, which we've tracked, a company in which we've invested where they are uh, doing 3D printing of, uh, 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 of simulated human livers for drug testing. Again, this We've invested in stem cell research, something which is looking at uh, breaking down stem cells for cancer. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really working with some of the global movies. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a plethora of, literally, I, 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 there is another company which is in manufacturing, Mukunda, which is mm -hmm. uh, built a product which automates dosa making. So, you know, just as you have a coffee vending machine and you press a button and you get the choice of your coffee, you press a button and you have a hot dosa on your plate. And you have a choice which dosa you want. You want a plain dosa or you want a masala dosa or an oil free dosa. So, <laughs> all of this is now sort of uh, coming to play, as I said, with Bhagavad entrepreneurship, innovation, productizing is sort of now hit like a virus across sectors in this country. So um, I'm going to ask you another trend question, and this is, I think, a bit different in India than what we see in uh, in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., right now, there has been a tremendous uh, surge in uh, micro VCs and uh, you know angels coming together and creating funds and so forth, and and there is there. I think the 2013 number was 70,000. Um, seed funded companies, but the series A number still remains quite small. It's only about 1,200, and that also remains constant. So in, this, in Silicon Valley, there is a big series A gap that has opened up. The India story is different. In India, there is not that much seed capital in the system, the, and it's very difficult, actually, to get seed money. Um, how do you see the seed to series A equation in India? You know, you're right. Uh, 
you know, when IEM started, the real gap in the market was at half a million dollars, right? So after an entrepreneur has invested friends, family, and fool's money round, it was very hard to get any money. And that was the gap that IEM sort of tried to plug by bringing in angel investing. Yeah. Today, angel investing is now an established itself as an asset class in H and I portfolios. It's become center spread. You know, if you look at Economic Times or any of these dailies, you'll see something or the other on angel investing in startups. So yeah. that that gap is getting starting to get plugged. Okay, and there's a lot of active in, and the growth of angel investing in this country has been pretty sharp uh, curve. But the gap today that we see is uh, more in one to five million uh, mm-hmm. funding that companies. So post angel funding, companies are finding it extremely hard to uh, get their next round, which is usually one to five million. Number two is to get money from quality investors who can still handhold them. They are still young. They still need handholding and mentoring. So while funds are getting created, I think in this, this last year or two, the government has put in the fund of fund of startups and a couple of other ministries have put in money and there is domestic LP money that is starting to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is very difficult for companies to get that one to four million. And many good companies are falling off the cliff because they're just funding delayed or funding denied, as I would say. Well, part of the issue, um, my observation, let me just comment on what you said. Um, You know, in India, yes, you're saying that companies are growing fast, but even, you know, for for venture scale company growth, that is, you know, hyper fast growth that VCs look for to invest in companies and to demonstrate the ability to grow at that kind of accelerated pace is not easy, and and especially if companies are catering through the Indian market. You know, if you're if they're India-facing companies, I think the growth rates don't reach that level, and that is one of the issues that is causing the you know the gap between the seed and the Series A in India. That it's a difference reason and a different um, analysis of the market. Um, at the same time, well, I, you know, I, as you know, I'm a very big proponent of bootstrapping. Indian entrepreneurs are good at bootstrapping. No, I take your point. I think we ourselves encourage companies to bootstrap. I mean, I know of a company um, uh, where they were raising about uh, – how much were they raising? They were raising about 150000 about three, three years ago from us. And uh, when I looked at their cash flow and I looked at their projections, I said, you know, why don't you go try and bootstrap and raise it yourself? Company has mm-hmm. done extremely well. They've ra- they became a top line of 20 crores and they came and raised money with us after that. So yes. I'm a big proponent of uh, bootstrapping. But to your po- earlier point, what I would like to also point out that companies which are raising post angel funded, they're still young, nascent, and they need mentoring and help apart from money. Okay. Yeah. And many many GPs of funds are not really entrepreneurs in their earlier life. So the value no, right. that they can do their risk, their risk taking ability, their operational insights are a little little different to what companies may need as mm-hmm. guidance from their investors. And that is where IEN has launched the fund. And it's mm-hmm. a very interesting fund because while we have the normal SEBI registered uh, GP led, I'm a founding partner and GP of the fund, but more interesting is the fact that companies will not only be able to raise money from us, but now we have 470 investors on our platform who we can access for domain expertise, mentoring, market network, helping them in every mm-hmm. way. So, And what is the size of the fund? The size of the fund is 70 million U.S. 
And okay. For the company now, the IM platform represents a way of raising money from thirty thousand US dollars to almost seven million US dollars on a single platform. So all mm-hmm. they need to do is to keep performing and growing the company, and money will be available. And money which is quality money, which which is credible and quality money with mentoring, relevant market access, whatever. It is mm-hmm. an ecosystem in which we can just grow. So mm-hmm. I think that is the new gap that we identified post our, you know, post identifying the angel gap. This mm-hmm. is the new gap in the country where we have positioned this fund. And second thing that we have done is 60% of the fund is raised, committed. And we mm-hmm. started operations and invested in six companies all in a period of a quarter. But interestingly, the 60%, or entire 60% of the corpus has been raised in India, domestic money, which mm-hmm. is which is bucking the trend to say that you know VC yeah. yeah. funds find it very difficult to raise money in India, and therefore they raise a lot of money overseas. Okay, Almost yeah. 80% of the corpus is raised overseas. We yeah. already raised 60% of the corpus in India, and we are still raising. So, mm-hmm. so you know. We are out. We are an ecosystem player. We are not like any other fund. We bringing men. We believe in bringing mentoring, expertise, market, whatever help we can do, we would help. And yes, we also bring money. Yeah. So that is the new trend that we are trying to set. So, uh, Padma, there are two more questions that I want to cover before we finish. Um, one is, how do you parse? unicorn mania you know this is something really unfortunate that happened that india basically copied the stupidity from silicon valley which is unicorn mania how do you react to that how do you process this how does your uh, in network process this you know, trend? So, so i just want to answer that very very simply over the years at iim on the investor table we have never invested in any company or had a discussion of even investing in a company on the basis of valuation game alone or market share game alone. It has always been focused on top line, bottom line, EBITDA. And that old-fashioned business model and business trends has sustained us and we've not had this problem on our investor, uh, in our portfolio. So, I don't. But I, have you invested? Uh, have you invested in any no. company that has got caught into this unicorn mania? Because as an angel group, you could get buried on the later stage liquidation preferences if there's a company that starts to play that game with other investors, follow-on investors. No. We, so we did invest in a company which went down the unic, which got affected by the unicorn mania. But I want to also point out that before it went there, we exited the company and made our money. So we did not get impacted. <laughs> good point. So this is actually a very good point, and I, I'm uh, you know, talking to lots of angel investors on this point, is that co-sale rights, right? You have to kind of, if you're doing angel investment today or seed stage investment today, you kind of have to negotiate co-sale rights so that you can get out before unicorn mania buries you under liquidation preferences. Yeah, yeah, and I believe very strongly that investing is the easiest part. You have to know when to exit because yeah. the timing of both are important and the structure yes. of both are important. Yes, absolutely. So last question, you know, one of my observations is that we are in 2017. Lots of stuff have already been built. And nowadays there aren't as many wide open large opportunities, especially when you look at B2B. Um, but there are many niche opportunities. And, um, and in India, I would say even in B2C, there are lots of niche opportunities. And some of these businesses need to be built for very small amounts of capital, maybe one to two million. Um, and sold for 10 to 15 million. In some cases, they could be built for 250 to 500K, sold for five to 10 million. This is, you know, uh, these are opportunities, and especially with India's cost structure and the generally frugal um, dynamics of the uh, entrepreneurs, 
this seems to be right up India's alley. How are you processing this um, kind of um, dynamic? No, I think that's a very interesting observation. I think um, what we are looking at is, yes, we are absolutely picking up niche um, uh, plays. We also understand that these would not need too much of money, which is interesting. But I think what, is in, what we focus on are two aspects. That after we've invested, can the company sustain and grow on its cash um, earnings, right? Mm -hmm. And secondly, at what point we, we do invest with a perspective, not only that we would get a cash return or a return from a next round investor, but mm -hmm. then these are plays that get acquired. So who are the likely acquisition partners or acquirers? And I think in India, the acquisition and the M&A play is starting to open up. And uh, mm -hmm. that is what I find very interesting. And those acquisition plays are giving reasonable returns. Again, I want to I want to underpin it with one comment, like, Angel investing in startups and entrepreneurship have, are young in this country. We are not as developed. Acquisition right. is just starting, right? Yes. So I I think the part it will take, the returns it will give, the way it will work out, it's, it's still to play out. But we have been very, very well, uh, in an infancy. So yeah, in this young. case, though, this the investment, the acquisition opportunities are going to be global. Um, you know, a lot of companies. India has developed a lot of software expertise at this point. So, building software products that can be tuck-in acquisitions for larger technology companies, global technology companies, in in, in either, U.S. technology companies. That I think that trend will pick up and and. We just need to kind of create the ecosystem to not be obsessed with these unicorns. Every, if everybody wants to build unicorns, well, there aren't that many unicorn ideas out there. Those are rare, few and far between ideas. That's why they're called unicorns. That's true, but also remember that India is not only cre uh, creating companies which focus only on the Western market. There is a no, no, I agree. Yeah. On the on the B2C India facing market, that's a whole different story. Yes, and the second is that those M and A's are happening quicker because the innovation, the talent, the products that are getting here built here are very robust compared to what you may get in other countries. Yeah, very good. Padmada, thank you for uh, parking your car and and staying on the roadside. For for 40 minutes <laughs> to be with us. So let's keep in touch. We'll uh, we'll work together more in, in due course. Sure, sure. I'd love to Bye. Bye bye. Take care. All right, folks. We're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch section of the uh, program today. Let me set expectations a bit. Remember, this is a working session. And we want you to succeed. We are here to help you succeed, to give you some feedback that will hopefully remove some roadblocks and help you strategize better with what, how to put one foot before the other. This is, you can feel completely safe. There is no other agenda here other than helping you move forward. Um, it's very possible that you may disagree with what, what you hear here, and that's fine too. Remember one thing, though, not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. So please don't be obsessed about raising money. This is a problem that we see continuously in the market, and it's just not a pleasant um, you know, trend to see because companies fail because of their obsession for raising money. So we're going to start with Kanchan Dwevedi. Kanchan, please uh, unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Kanchan is dialing in from Bangalore, India. Uh, thank you, Shramana, for this opportunity to be presenting Welcome. and you know taking your advice. Please go ahead. I'm looking so, forward to hearing what you're doing. 
Sure, sure. Uh, so, so yeah. So uh, the other um, thing I wanted to uh, also share with you was that I, I really appreciate uh, the one million by one million in the initiative of yours for uh, bringing entrepreneurs onto a global stage and uh, providing with them with a lot of help. And so, really appreciate that. Uh, so, going back to uh, um, thank you. I'm based out of Bengaluru, um, and uh, my startup is uh, called Loan Genie. Uh, it is a peer-to-peer -peer online lending platform that aims to connect borrowers with lenders mm -hmm. in a, a faster, uh, cheaper, paperless uh, way, uh, providing more attractively priced loans to uh, unserved and underserved Indians. Okay. I can be reached at uh, loangenie.com and uh, also if you are uh, anybody is interested uh, they can uh, look for loan genie on twitter facebook and linkedin yes my target customer is um, the middle class which is slated to be 267 million uh, as per the 2016 statistics uh, mostly professionals and millennials i got inspired to a startup with Loan Genie uh, due to a personal experience, a painful experience I had while trying to take a loan in India. Mm -hmm. And my endeavor is to make uh, loan processing a data-driven process, uh, which makes uh, also use uh, uh, technology to make the loans cheaper for the people, make, make it faster, uh, less paper intensive, uh, and basically friction-free. So, okay. um, uh, yeah, Shramana, uh, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, the two ways that I can look at uh, acquiring customers, which would be both uh, borrowers as well as lenders, would be both online as well as offline methods. Uh, my go-to market strategy would involve having um, online presence in terms of uh, the, uh, the social media channels already mentioned, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, uh, blogs, articles, events, online and offline ads. Uh, so those would be some of the ways. Um, I'm looking at customer validation from borrowers as well as lenders when they register onto my platform. And taking a hypothetical case, I uh, took uh, close to 5,000 customers logging in um, at a very conservative uh, like time frame uh, during maybe six months time period. And mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and so th these are all estimations actually, uh, with an average loan size of a uh, uh, you know hundred thousand, uh, which is one lakh Indian uh, money, and um, uh, US dollars one thousand five hundred. Uh, so that would be a total of uh, fifty crore uh, rupees worth of loans dispersed, or seven point six million US dollars with a revenue per loan of uh, rupees 3,000 or US dollar 45, with a total revenue coming out to 1.5 crores uh, or US dollars 230,000 over a period of uh, six months. So that's a, uh, this, some, this is a guesstimate. Um, so based on the kind of research that I did, uh, so it's a very conservative guesstimate uh, that I have come up with. Um, so, could we go over to the next slide, Shramana, please? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so uh, at this point in time, uh, Shramana, my uh, question was, uh, I'm at a very early stage, just five months into uh, existence as a startup. Um, I'm looking at uh, building an MVP uh, for Loan Genie and releasing it to uh, a selected audience. So, which is why my question was, is there a recommended number of people to whom we can release the, the beta product? So let me actually go uh, give you feedback across the board so that you can, it will, I will come to answering those questions and it, you have to kind of derive those answers a little bit from some of the issues that I'm going to point out to you. So before sure. I even go into the, um, the beta and, and all of that, the positioning and stuff, there's one question that is, you know, dominant in my mind right now, it's the question of regulation. The Indian market is very, very heavily regulated when it comes to uh, fintech products. So you need to research 
what regulation mm -hmm. you have to deal with. Uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. So, um, so uh, yeah, so the regulations were, uh, like, the, the directives have been announced uh, very recently, as recent as yesterday. So mm -hmm. RBI has announced uh, regulation uh, directives, I would say, for uh, the P2P space uh, yesterday. And yeah. uh, so they, they have mentioned the, the uh, P2P lenders to be uh, to, uh, to request for um, um, recognition as an NDFC. So they have to uh, apply for that. They have to have a minimum uh, two crores or 20 million INR as, um, as, as capital reserve with them. Uh, mm -hmm. Or uh, such, or whatever money uh, the bank, uh, the Reserve Bank of India deems um, uh, appropriate. So, and, and what is the process of getting that certification? Because if for you, the the proposition that you are creating here, for this proposition right. to grow, you're going to need to bring together a critical mass of such people, get them certified, and and set up to be able to transact in such a system, which. You need to thoroughly understand what is the process of that and how long does it take to get people on board and how long does, does it take for you to create that critical mass? And where are you right. going to recruit so, them from? So, uh, Shamana, just the just thing is uh, uh, the borrowers will uh, register on the platform uh, to borrow money and the lenders will register uh, will, uh, so registering is basically providing the details and it is a uh, the platform's responsibility to ensure that they are authentic. Um, uh, you are assuming well you're assuming that yeah. all that is going to they're going to be doing all that behind the scenes. You will discover as you get into this business that that monkey is right. going to be on your back. Most of these people, even if they have that level of net worth, may not have done the paperwork because they have no reason to do the paperwork. You know, if they want to sure. participate in these kinds of platforms, they want, they need to do the paperwork. But until they do, they haven't done the paperwork. So you're going to have to create process and to, you know, take the friction out of the, you know, the sand out of the gear, so to speak, so that you do get a critical mass of lenders first. The borrowers will come if there are lenders. If you don't have lenders, there's no, there will be no borrowers coming. Yes, so, so that's something so, that you need yeah. a lot of thought into is, is a significant number of lenders. How are you going to get to them? How are you going to recruit them? And how are you going to bring them onto the platform? So there will need to be, you know, I would say a few hundred lenders um, right. as Absolutely. part of the yeah, yeah. data process. So that's number one. Yes, number two is sure. on the other side of the coin, you can't build a business with an assumption that right. you're going to be catering to the 267 million middle class. That is not a segment. You have to isolate right. the, this and into a segment where you want to really act actively market and recruit customers from. And that right. will drive how you go to market. Right now, right. based on what you've presented, it is, this is not a business plan. This is a very 30,000 foot level, you know, back of the envelope, napkin level idea. It has none of these details figured out. And you're going to need to flesh out all these details of exactly where you're going to position this business, how you're going to position this business, how you're going to what, and the resultant customer acquisition strategy. You're going to need right. to, uh, for, you know, to validate, you're going to need to basically get like a few hundred lenders and several thousand borrowers onto the platform and actually show transactions. And until you do sure. that, I don't think you're going to get any seed investment. So there's no need to connect with seed firms in the U.S. right now. You're many months, you're 18 months away from being interesting to any seed investor right now. Right. Sure, 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 sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I think uh, I'm pretty much done, and you know, thanks so much for the advice. You're um, welcome. Yeah, thank hang you. on, we can talk more if you have questions. I will be talking uh, a little bit later about uh, after I finish the other presentations. Um, I will be talking ab about how to use the program if you want to, um, and you can sure, ask more sure. questions there as well. Sure, okay, thank you. 
Good presentation. Parker Marlon, you're up next. Oh, Marlon Parker. Hey, Marlon um, Parker, I'm sorry. Hello, Marlon, how me? are you? Yes, we can I'm hear you. I'm fine, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Good day. My name is Marlon Parker. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Ms. Mitra. And this is an honor just to get that off the ground. Um, I'm healing from Belize City, Belize, Central America. I'm an aspiring entrepreneur with intentions of pioneering a novel approach to overcoming marketing challenges. And um, that's why we're here. Um, RBB, what it is I'm doing, it's actually at the concept stage. I haven't actually gotten to developing my MVP yet, but it's basically a unique software-based social networking platform designed to expertly boost businesses as well as the community at large. Now, this may be something that you would like to know why I'm trying to do this, but um, it's the concept behind it is it's a revolutionary self-esteem and business boosting service platform. Why social networking? Well, um, social networking, according to the latest information, over the last decade, has been a, there's been a shift away from static web pages towards web applications like social networking, which draw on user data. And this mm -hmm. has been because businesses are utilizing social media integration into the way businesses are run. Now, um, my project is called the Harbinger Project. And as you can see, I left a link there. And, um, you know, you could check that when you get a chance. Sorry. Um, the problem, due to gross inefficiencies with the current marketing technology available, the business community, in my opinion, could use some help. This is because with the technology that I'm proposing, um, without this technology, sorry, the future is restricted to the inefficiencies and costs of information hoarding, which is the current industry standard slash best practice in data collection. Now, we all know this. Um, I don't think I need to really elaborate. Also, with RBB technology that I'm proposing, there's a much better way to a more secure future, which means there's improved data collection without the unbearable inefficiencies and costs associated with information hoarding. Now, this is because the way my technology is going to be designed, it's going to be in a very effective manner that uses certain tools that will allow this to be. Um, you can move to the next slide. Uh, the solution, in my opinion, right? With this innovation through niche and beyond marketing facilitation, which I'm pioneering, we are affording businesses the efficiency of niche marketing and the flexibility of mass marketing combined. This has never been done before. Now, this is because through the way or the approach that I'm using, we can, for the first time, utilize a very careful strategy that will allow businesses to be marketed in such a way that it it um, blows people's minds and it can have the type of maneuverability that we can, we never saw before, basically. Um, along with the fact that Internet consumers have a sensible lack of confidence in the Internet marketplace, um, this will basically help us because businesses don't have the type of maneuverability that I'm proposing here. Okay. Um, yeah, the market discovery. As you can see, I found myself the bullet blocker. I generated this idea because I was imagining a world where businesses in a single effort can be economically boosted utilizing our platform and service. Now, this is because marketers are already primed to spend more than ever to address these inefficiencies. There are certain inefficiencies here that I can highlight where, according to Smart Insight members, top marketing activities that will give their businesses the biggest incremental uplift in lead and sales in 2017 are big data, including market and customer insights and predictive analysis. Analysis, I'm sorry. Content marketing communities, branded niche, or vertical communities. Also, in a new study, developing and improving digital channels, 60% was the leading action being taken by marketers to improve customer experience. Based Marlon, on another survey, brand, I'm sorry? Marlon, I'm going to stop you for a moment. Okay. You know, we've already spent several minutes on your presentation, and I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's not a good situation to put your audience in. 
you have to within you know 30 seconds to a minute of starting your presentation clearly articulate what is it that you're doing and okay. the fact that we are already so far into your presentation and i have absolutely no idea what the hell you're talking about is not a good no good thing okay. so tell me in 30 seconds what is your value proposition? What problem are you solving and how are you solving it? Like I said, I was attempting to solve the current marketing challenges that are there. First of all, in data collection, when it comes to the current marketing technology, data collection is a big issue because most marketers or businesses, after they have received the data, they have problem deriving value from it due to certain inefficiencies with the technology. So again, so, you're, you're stating something that is not true. There are you know millions right now of companies that address data collection problems, data processing problems, converting data into insights problems. The market is incredibly crowded. Marketing technology is one of the most crowded markets in the whole information technology universe. So, so that statement, uh, to begin with that statement is false. So you well, have to I be am, very I'm sorry, specific. But I'm going by the, okay, yeah, but I'm going by the latest information that was available in the earlier beginning this year, 2017. This is the latest information. According no, this to is not the, the latest data. information. I'm sorry, Marlon. I, I just can't agree with you on that. That information is false information. Okay. So there is a lot of information, yes, there, and there are lots of solutions of how to manage those information that information. So the question is, what are, what are you doing or what do you want to do that is special, that is differentiated, and that is that fills a gap in the market? So your first order of business is to really study the marketing technology mar uh, market, you know, the competitive market of who's doing what, what's out there, and so on and so forth. So your level of knowledge is very low to get into this market, and, and your first order of business is to really, really come up to speed on what is out there, what is happening, who's doing what in marketing technology. Yes, well, I hear you. So, um, so this presentation but, at this point is really, it doesn't convey anything to me. I understand that, but I, I the, the, the information that was made available to me was what I presented, so I apologize for that. I'm sorry. No, it's not a question of you being sorry. I'm, I'm just telling you your next step is to really d deeply okay. dive into marketing technology and what's happening in the industry. The marketing technology is a whole big industry in itself. And if you want to be yes, no. in that industry, you really need to understand what is the prior art, what has happened, who has done what, who is doing what, who is getting traction in that market, what businesses are growing, what products are being adopted, etc. And And without that knowledge, you cannot really position a new company. But this is your first step. If you have passion about this particular space, you can – you basically start there, start by learning what's happening, and then see where you can find a gap where you can come up with a new solution. Yes, Mom, thanks, I appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Folks, um, if you like what we are doing here, as you can see, the feedback is very direct and very candid, but it's constructive. We have, you know, there's absolutely no malice or meanness in the feedback we give you. It's purely 100% directed towards, with the goal of helping you get better and make progress and work through the uh, roadblocks that you will inevitably face. We all face roadblocks in building companies. So if you like what we do here, bring in serious entrepreneurs into 1M1M. There are lots of entrepreneurs out there who are looking for help and we are here to help them. We focus on IT and IT-enabled services, and we focus on serious entrepreneurs who are willing to do the heavy lifting required to build significant companies. Everything resource-wise is at 1mby1m.com. You go there and you'll find a whole treasure trove of data and information and trends and 
guidance and material, learning material. You can start with our blog, which is rich, really, really rich. Just by following the blog, you're going to learn a lot. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series is another body of learning material. There are 12 volumes, all of, uh, available on Amazon. Um, you can double click on any topic and learn with the, these books are case study oriented. So there are 12 to 16 case studies per book on the topic that we're dealing with, whether it's cloud computing or e-commerce or unicorns or bootstrapping with a paycheck. Each of these are case study based books that you can learn that topic on. These roundtables happen every Thursday. Right now we have no break until Thanksgiving. So every Thursday we have roundtables. So feel free to go to the website, sign up on the free roundtables page to attend or to pitch. And we look forward to working with you in the further sessions. The full acceleration program from 1 million by 1 million is premium, 1M by 1M premium. And there we give you extensive methodology guidance, we have a full curriculum, online curriculum, over 300 hours worth of curriculum, and you get to study at your own pace. This is also fully case study based. Uh, we help you with business development. We have a tremendous network, and you have access to that entire network uh, by being part of the premium program. We do have strategy consulting on your project. So you learn methodology through the curriculum, and then you learn you get project-based consulting and coaching through private roundtables, similar to these, but they're private closed-door sessions. We help you with financing. We have a tremendous financing network as well, um, and you can you know, get access to that financing network. You have to become fundable first. We will help you do that, but, but you do have uh, access to our entire financing network through the program as well. And um, you can also uh, access the media and media channels that we have access to. We do have a very significant footprint in online media, and you can access that through us. That whole program is a $1,000 annual membership fee. You can be in the program for as many years that, as you need to to work through your uh, challenges. The one-on-one -on -one self-assessment is a free questionnaire on the blog. On the, on the website, you can look at it and you should answer these questions. These are questions that investors would ask you. We recommend that you answer these questions of yourself about your business right away. And it will help you streamline your strategic thinking. So um, all of you, I would strongly recommend that you go through these questions and try to really get solid answers to each of these issues. If you run into methodology gaps, which you very well may, methodology is something, you know, if you're first-time entrepreneurs, you don't know a lot of this methodology, but take it as an opportunity to learn. You can sign up for 1M1M one &one Basic, which is our monthly $99 per month kind of program, and you have access to the curriculum, and you can plug all your methodology gaps just by studying, basically, the material that we offer you. So dig around on the website, there's tons of information, what to expect from premium, basic, lots of FAQs, video FAQs, information about the curriculum, all the introductions, network, everything is fully articulated. And um, as I said, it's a case study based program. We've had over 750 successful entrepreneurs participate in designing the curriculum in with their case studies, their methodologies, their successes, their strategies, and all that is available to you. You basically get to stand on the shoulders of over 750 successful entrepreneurs, and it's incredibly powerful to learn from them. Um, our methodology is lean, capital-efficient, bootstrap startups. You, even if you raise money, you have to bootstrap first, raise money later. Even if you do raise money, you still have to bootstrap to conserve that cash and get as far as possible with that money, with that runway. So that's pretty much it. Three more roundtables in October. Uh, please sign up on the website. Also, uh, last week, actually, we had our first in-person rendezvous in Mellow Park. There are three more coming up, October 19th, November 9th, December 13th, uh, where I'll be available at Cafe Boroni in Menlo Park. And if you are from Silicon Valley or if you're visiting Silicon Valley, if you'd like to come to one of these 
please uh, please come by and I look forward to meeting you there. Um, that's pretty much it. We can go to Q&A. Yes, question. Uh, you are welcome to either dial in and ask your questions or just type in your questions in public chat and I will pick it up and answer those questions. Renwick is asking, can I sign up to pitch even though I'm not yet a premium member? Yes, these are free public roundtables, so you can, anybody can pitch once. Um, so if you haven't pitched yet, then please sign up and, and you're absolutely most welcome to come and pitch. Um, Paul, you were asking, you mentioned in the previous roundtable B2M, please define. Uh, I. B2M? Renrick is a new tech startup in Bahamas. I'm not sure, Paul, what you're referring to. Can you give me a bit more context? That would be great to uh, hear from a new tech startup in Bahamas, B2B, B2C, yes. I don't recall B2M. Hmm. I don't remember, Paul. I'm sorry, I, if you point me to the round table where I mentioned that, I will take a look and, uh, and try to clarify. Maulana Moore is asking, what level of detail do you expect in a pitch? Are there certain areas, questions you expect to be covered? You know, the first thing you need to cover is a very clear articulation of what problem you're solving, what is the pain that you're solving, and what is your value proposition? How do you solve that problem? And then we want to cover what is your positioning? What is the customer segment that you're going after? What, you know, how do you proposed to acquire those customers, what is the go-to-market strategy. So those are, you know, things that we like to cover in the pitch. You know, I suggest that you look at the self-assessment. The more of those questions that you can cover in a very crisp pitch, the better and the stronger your pitch is. The, the more clarity you're going to have about your, uh, your presentation. So go look at the self-assessment before you pitch, and it would really help you clarify how you present. Shuren Sarkar, who was at the rendezvous last week, I actually met him in person recently, is asking why is there such little funding in Silicon Valley on specific business verticals and why so much funding for horizontal problems? This is no longer true, Shuren. Right now, uh, there's a lot of vertical financing and some of these companies have even gone public. A very good example is Viva. Uh, Viva is a CRM for uh, the healthcare industry, biotech and so forth. That company has done superbly well and scaled phenomenally, got tons of venture funding. Right now, in fact, if you look at the AI universe, there's a lot of interest in AI funding um, and almost all of it is going into verticals because people are interested in not just the horizontal AI models, people are interested in domain-specific intelligence um, and AI built in to solve, built in to solve domain-specific problems with domain-specific intelligence part as part of the model. So it's a, it's very much vertical oriented right now. Anybody else? Other questions? Please keep asking questions in the public chat or by calling in. Let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson. She'd be happy to answer questions about the program. Irina at 1m1m.com. Any other questions, folks? We do have time today. By the way, um, I don't know if you have looked at the podcast channel that we launched in May. It is now very heavily populated with great podcasts. So. Uh, Please do take a look at that. Maureen can provide a link here to, uh, 
to the podcast channel. Um, yes, it's on iTunes. It's on all podcast platforms. So iTunes, yes, absolutely. Um, Valana Moore is asking one follow-up. Can the area of problem solution be any market? Yeah, any market, as long as you are solving the problem with IT or IT-enabled services. That's our uh, core organizing principle for the 1M1M one &one program. We only work with IT and IT-enabled services, but it can be any market. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Introductions, I, I love to hear where you're coming from, uh, which, uh, you know, geographically, what business, are, what kind of business are you working on? Uh, this is a networking opportunity as well. So both for uh, my benefit, for the one and one and team's benefit, as well as uh, one another's benefit for your peer-to-peer -peer networking, this is a good point to, good time to tell us where you're coming from. So Maureen has put the, podcast link on iTunes on your screen, so um, on your chat screen, so please feel free to check that out. And also, if you like the podcast, please also review it for us. That would be very helpful because uh, we put in a lot of effort into bringing this channel uh, to bear. Uh, Marlana Moore is uh, in New York City. Paul is in East Coast, D.C. Parker, Marlon Parker is in Belize, of course. Um, Paul Ramos is working on an authenticity platform. Mahesh Sharma is from Bangalore. Rishi Gupta from New York. Great, very diverse geographically. Well, I hope um, you all will pitch in this up, upcoming sessions and we'll have a chance to really work on your businesses together. And those of you who have already pitched, if you would like to uh, work more closely with me, please join the premium program, and uh, I would be delighted to coach you in more depth and detail. Mahesh Sharma, how can come the attendees cannot see each other? That is just the way we set up WebEx. Shoren Sarkar, do you feel decentralized networks with blockchains will reduce the need for centralized monopolies such as Facebook and reduce the need for traditional forms of growth capital? Well, um, it depends on what the application of blockchain is. I think Facebook got a particular, um, you know, niche. I mean, it's not niche, it's a huge uh, positioning. They've basically brought the world together on one platform and you can do both subgroups and groups and, you know, small uh, localized as well as interest-based groups and so forth. You can have many different permutations and combinations of decentralized networks on top of the core Facebook platform, which is incredibly powerful. Um, I think blockchains have different purposes. You can have blockchain-based uh, networks that power very different functions. You know, you can actually function, uh, do all kinds of business processes that are built on blockchain-based networks and so forth. So I think there, there will be a lot of interesting businesses that will emerge out of blockchain-based architectures. Uh, but, that, but I think Facebook is serving a very different purpose uh, than what you're talking about. Issue is data hoarding and content creators are not getting compensated other platform usage. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of coverage on this topic right now on uh, data hoarding and the content creators not getting compensated. The data hoarding issue, um, there are, you know, proposals that uh, people need to own their data and not the networks like Facebook and, um, and Facebook would need to be paid to for people to use the networks instead of just selling their data as a skeleton. They would need to pay additional to the – Facebook would need, need to pay the consumers a fee to access their data. So there, these conversations are going on as we speak, and I'm sure in the upcoming uh, months and years you will see a lot more discussion on the issue of Facebook becoming too powerful – to, uh, you know, using data at will 
um, that data and, and the questions around who legitimately should be owning that data. This, this is a very vital question that is going to continue be, to be discussed for a while until answers emerge on that topic. Does that answer your question, Sharon? Yeah. Anybody else? I think The Economist has uh, articles on this topic in one of the recent issues I saw, I think the one before the, this last one. You know, I think this is a solution that will have to happen. This conversation will require governments and regulators to step in. And the solution will have to come from Facebook itself. Uh, Facebook will need to address these questions. Facebook will need, just like, you know, Facebook is in hot water right now on the Russia issue, how Russians, um, Russian ads, uh, you know, basically damage the U.S. election. Um, this is a question that Facebook did not acknowledge responsibility for for a while, but now, now they have acknowledged and they're going to have to address these issues. So Facebook has basically grown so fast and to become, has become so powerful. There are very, very big questions that are emerging and, and it's going to have to be regulated. It'll have to, uh, you know, work with the governments to answer these questions. It's inevitable. There's no choice. Um, Paul Ramos is asking, how much traction should, should you see in REV, revenue? Your REV is revenue before you attempt seed or any bridge funding. Uh, if you're talking about revenue, you know, it's not, seed doesn't always require revenue even. It could be revenue, it could not be revenue, but it, it requires a clear validation that customers have appetite for your product and are willing to pay for it. That's what is the real issue. With, before you go for seeds, that is something you've got to get validated. You have 24 accounts now, and, and what, is the, uh, what is your business and what is the state of those accounts? And, and Paul, I would strongly recommend if you haven't pitched already, come and pitch at, at the next round table and we can go over your business. It's hard to, you know, actually give meaningful business feedback with so little information, but that's, this is what the program is set up for is to have, you know, deep discussions about your business. So come and pitch and, and let's work on your business and I'll give you very concrete pointers and guidance. Anybody else? Don't have a pitch deck? Well, create one. You're going to have to create a pitch deck sooner or later, so create one. Take this opportunity, take this as a, as a forcing function to create a pitch deck. By the way, the, you can also use 1M1M Basic. We have great templates and great training on, uh, on the financing issues in the, um, curriculum, so you can access that by doing one and one in basic as well. And also look at the self-assessment. I keep telling you this key, look at the self-assessment. You have to answer those questions in a pitch deck. All right, anybody else? Okay, folks. Looks like we've covered all the questions. We will meet you back here uh, next week, same place, same time, and continue the conversation. Do remember to check out the podcast channel, and, uh, and we would very much appreciate, appreciate your reviews of the podcast channel on iTunes. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.